Hey, welcome to Brute Facts. I got a fun show tonight. I have the one and only Jay Dyer, author, uh, co-creator of the TV show, the uh, Hollywood Un Hollywood Decoded. Um, also pretty philosophically inclined, theologically inclined, and recently uh, myself been looking at a lot of the things that he puts up on YouTube uh, as far as, um, you know, philosophy goes um, and theology. So I'm excited for this one. Hang out. I appreciate everybody that's here and we'll be on in a minute. Hello, hello. How are you, Jay? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, so why don't you give us a short introduction about you? Yeah, I'm a guy who started doing media analysis, movie analysis, writing essays on geopolitics, film, philosophy, kind of throwing in my own weird brand of humor, maybe about 12 years ago, and uh, started as a, a blogger. Uh, while I was doing my undergraduate and then graduate work. And uh, then it kind of turned into its own thing and just sort of snowballed. I uh, did a couple books. We did a one season of a TV show and uh, expanded into doing debates uh, on various topics, religious issues, Muslims, Roman Catholics, atheists. Uh, and then um, 
uh, took over hosting the fourth hour of a L E X J O N E S in the last year. So that's pretty much what I do is, uh, just talk about all these crazy topics and just sort of throw in my own, my own spin. Um, and as you said, a lot of it does deal with, uh, religious comparative religion, theology, apologetics, but there's also other stuff too. So I do a lot of, you know, yeah. movie stuff, like you said. Yeah. So <clears throat> were you, uh, so you're Eastern Orthodox, um were you raised as a christian or was there a time that you kind of became a christian how did that work i was raised uh southern baptist we were nominal we weren't really that serious about it we would maybe go for kind of holidays or every few months um but i did kind of get a loose kind of biblical education growing up uh so it did kind of imprint on me um i didn't really have much interest in religion at all throughout high school i was kind of a wild party guy i was the uh, wittiest guy my senior year so um then at uh, about age 18 or 19 i started reading the bible um it had it started having an effect on me i was still protestant at the time and then just kind of went on a really long rabbit hole journey of looking into different religions as well into my 30s and and uh, late 20s early 30s um, I didn't convert necessarily to other religions but I looked at them after many years of Roman Catholicism I ended up uh, leaving Protestants for, for Catholicism in my 20s and uh, for most of my 20s I was involved in that and then started having a lot of doubts about uh, the doctrine of the papacy and Vatican II in relationship to previous Roman Catholic teaching in the in the centuries prior to Vatican II and uh, just kind of got a little uh, disenchanted, I guess you could say, for maybe five or six years. Just I didn't really I wasn't atheist, but I kind of just had not much of a position except maybe loosely platonic or neoplatonic. Uh, I read a lot of perennialist works, perennialist philosophers. And um, then kind of in, in my uh, mid early to mid 30s, I sort of gradually kind of getting back into Christianity and uh, eventually for me that ended up being orthodoxy but it took me about 10 years to finally convert to orthodoxy so it was it was a long kind of roundabout journey through I don't know maybe three or four different positions that I held for a, a while and then and then finally ended up orthodox for the last several years yeah and the uh so you were a Van Til guy at one time weren't you yeah I went to Bonson Seminary when I was 20 one or two i think i did a year a year there and that was right when i was starting to question the protestant ethos um and it's sort of underpinnings with sola scriptura um i got really deep into bonson and Bantil. i read most of their printed works at that time and i uh, was very convinced of the argumentation the apologetic and the logical uh approach to proving god's existence and all that always appealed to me but at the same time, I was trying to square it with a lot of the theology in the Calvinist world, which was, you know, grounded in things like total depravity. And so I started thinking, well, how can the transcendental argument for God uh, be the case if we're also arguing for, you know, total depravity? And I would have email exchanges with a lot of the big um, uh, apologists at that time that were still alive. Like John Frame and I had several email exchanges back and forth about that kind of an issue. And uh, eventually, I just kind of wandered out of Protestantism and into Rome at that time. So, but um, I never really gave up tag, but I didn't really know what to do with tag when I went into the Roman Catholic world and kind of immersed myself in Thomism. So I just kind of held off and I thought, well, maybe there's some way to reconcile uh, Thomism with tag that I just don't know about. But uh, yeah, that was that was uh, yeah, in my early 20s that that did happen. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, first actual debate i ever watched was bonson um mm. the great debate and i i didn't even know what apologetics was and you know i i was just enthralled by you know his style and the way that he you know handedly won the debate <laughs> and Next thing you know, um, I was uh presuppositionalist guy myself and didn't even know what. Oh, I didn't, okay, was. I didn't know you were into all that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I grew up Southern Baptist, oh, um, okay. so yeah, me very, too, <laughs> very uh fundamentalist Southern Baptist, uh, you know, hyper literalism and mm. um, 
inerrancy, all these, you know, crazy things that uh, our Southern Baptists like to hold on to. Uh, so I've kind of run the gauntlet like you. And um, on me, I actually got into the philosophy side and the kind of theology and church history and things like that kind of was on the back burner. So I'm kind of late to the game, you know, really learning you know, church history. And, and so I'm still kind of like, it's odd because I went from being uh, a pre-sub mm -hmm. to uh, really liking Thomism mm -hmm. to now uh, looking at Eastern Orthodoxy. So um, gotcha. kind of a similar ride. I guess. Yeah, it is. But uh, are, are you, did you have an atheist agnostic phase? Yeah, I, I went through a total deconstruction um, from uh, fundamentalism. And, you know, it was we we lived in a poor neighborhood and grew up on the street. So for many years, I just didn't care about God. Um, and when I really started to look into it, all these beliefs that I had and just took as true, uh, just kind of tumbled around me. And I became agnostic uh, mm -hmm. for a short time. Mm hmm. Uh, and that's what kind of fueled me into, like you, looking at world religions. You know, I was convinced there was a God. Yeah. But I wanted to know who that God was. Right. So. Yeah, that's okay. I, I just, I wasn't trying to call you out. I just. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly yeah. of the trek that you had taken. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Very similar. Yeah, no, I'm an open book. I, you know, I, I, any, I'll talk about anything other than my wife. She's kind of mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so what was it about um Thomism that started to kind of push you away from it well when i was roman catholic i, I went uh from calvinism straight into roman catholicism i didn't have like an anglican side road or anything like that like a lot of people do i just went straight into um the, the roman catholic world and about after about a year of the Novus Ordo, I, I went pretty hardcore into the uh, latin mass community sspx so i was a trad catholic for for most of that time in the 20 in my 20s and um really i think rom that thomism it was e it was easy to accept uh coming from calvinism because i'd read for example arvin boss's book from calvin to aquinas and that that had an impact on me and showed kind of a lot of similarities that were there that I didn't think were there when I was a hardcore Calvinist. So that softened me up. And I think that just the, the Calvinist love and preference for systematization and that el the elegance of that intellectual system structure uh, was easy to accept. It was an easy move. But then when you're in the world of traditional Roman Catholicism and Thomism, you kind of think that it, it's just like the ultimate system and it's perfect and it's not really ever going to be, you're not going to find problems. And then you're kind of struck when you find these theological and philosophical problems that you just assumed were solvable or just wouldn't even be there. So, you know, uh, problems like um, created grace, problems like uh, monoenergism, uh, problems like um, issues with, Thomas's Christology, uh, problems with absolute divine simplicity, uh, all of those things eventually came on my radar when I started reading uh, Orthodox critiques of Thomism, as well as the Eastern Fathers and their their approach to uh, Trinitarian theology and, and Christology. And for a long time, I thought, well, I'm sure I can reconcile these somehow. There's got to be. So I try to kind of take it. I wasn't a uniate, but I try to think like, well, maybe there's a uniate answer to this. Eastern Catholics have a you know, maybe they have a unique way to approach Palamism and Thomism. And uh, over time, the more I read a lot of the academic works on the issue of absolute divine simplicity in the modern debate, I just saw that there just wasn't really any way to make Palamism mix with with Thomism. And so, um, yeah, th those are the main problems, I think, that kind of plague Thomism. And then there's other issues that relate to epistemology that, that I tried to debate with Trent. Um, but really, at root, at root, I think it's just two different conceptions of how we go about knowing God um, and what it means to participate in God. 
and the Thomistic system, I think, just fails on both accounts. Yeah, uh, and that was my for me, Thomism was a little different because coming from the philosophy side of it, I, you know, was already uh, had dealt with, you know, modal collapse, uh, necessitarianism and um, the, you know, the whole Pope thing was, you know, something I just couldn't really get on board with. Um, and I think I was drawn to Aquinas because of the, uh, you know, it seems to try to start strike a balance between, you know, empiricism and rationalism. And uh, but honestly, I think it was the challenge of trying to understand Thomism mm. that was what kept me, you know, uh, spending a lot of time there and, and being drawn to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, my uh, it, it's funny because. My wife is Italian and Roman Catholic mm. um, or the family grew up Roman Catholic. And, you know, here I was a Southern Baptist <laughs> trying to, you know, you got to be baptized. You got to do this. You, gotta, you know, all this. Mm -hmm. And now I agree far more, you know, with uh, a lot of Catholic, at least the way, you know, Catholics approach scripture and, mm -hmm. and you know, leave a lot of things open you know, for interpretation and things. And I lean far more in their camp than I ever would Southern Baptist anymore. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of come full circle. And right. She's just kind of sitting back going, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, so are, are you at a juncture where uh, Protestantism is kind of up in the air for you or have you moved towards Catholicism or you're open to Orthodoxy or wh where are you at really? So this is the uh, kind of the uh, holding pattern that I'm in now. Uh, the last six months I've been doing uh, really deep dives and in, in study into uh, Jewish theology and Jewish metaphysics um, in the early church, you know, uh, pre Nicene. Um, and I, to me, uh, I just see, it, there just seems to be so much there, at least on the Catholic side. I, now, Eastern Orthodoxy, I have, you know, Orthodoxy in general, you know, I've looked at uh, just briefly and didn't realize, you know, how much difference there was. Um, and honestly, it was um, a friend of ours that's in your server it was like uh on discord mm -hmm. he's like you need you know because i was talking about all these philosophical issues that i had with catholicism and mm. these issues that i had with you know judaism not seeming to kind of line up with you know the theology or the metaphysics of at least catholic um undergirding and uh he, you know, he's like, you need to, you know, check this, you know, this, I'd heard about the uh, essence and energy distinctions, you know, and these things were kind of intriguing to me. And the more that, uh, you know, I watch a lot of your videos and, you know, I've been in Discord server there and, you know, listen to you guys mm -hmm. talk about a lot of it. There seems to, at least my recent introduction to it, it seems as though the Eastern Orthodox is more true to the original Jewish theology um, than, you know, what uh, the Catholics are. Yeah. And that's something I find extremely compelling, you know, because, you know, I, I want to get to, you know, the genuine original, you know, uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. not kind of this watered down stuff that we have in the U S and yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been pretty interesting and, and I'm still, you know, I'm starting to uh, read some Maximus, the confessor and um, have uh, actually the uh, Orthodox study Bible that you recommended. Uh, I got it on the way. 
Uh, I couldn't get the leather bound. That was a little bit expensive, but <laughs> so. Yeah, I think in the pre Nicene uh, theologians and church fathers, you do see um, elements that are kind of that anticipate the later theology of people like St. Maximus or the Cappadocians. If you look at St. Theophilus, for example, you see him clearly making the essence and distinction. If you read uh, St. Irenaeus is against heresies, you see him making a distinction between um, God's will uh, and God's generation. And so there's a difference between the generating of the sun and the creating of the world. And that's really just the a version of the essence and distinction. Uh, and really that those, models or those approaches are not what you see when we get up into the middle ages in the west with aquinas and his his um, basically identification of nature and person and god his identification of the attributes with the essence and the dogmatization of that strict uh, identity thesis view at the fourth lateran council so um, there is a difference there and i think that that's really the key to what distinguishes the two views because it's not the Western model of the Trinity that's accepted at the, ecumen the Second Ecumenical Council. It's the Cappadocian model. The Cappadocian model emphasizes the monarchy of the Father and thus the distinctions of the persons rather than beginning with an abstraction of the unity of the essence. So the, there's one God because there's one Father. So we, we know God first and foremost as the person of the Father and then by extension his generated Son and the spirated Spirit. So that's a different model. It's a different approach, a different order of theology than pretty much the totality of the West from the time of the Middle Ages until uh, even the, ref the reformers pretty much default to that Augustinian view. Um, and that's not even, it shouldn't be really that, con I mean, that controversial in, unless you're just mired in, in Latin theology, because if you read uh, Radigalwitz's uh, uh, PhD thesis on this topic, that's essentially what he says, is that it's just... It's, pretty obvious if you read the the Cappadocians and compare them to Augustine that they have different Trinitarian views and models and the, the ecumenical church did not approve the Augustinian model it accepted the Cappadocian model so you would think that Roman Catholics for all their hailing of you know the ecumenical council so they apparently don't care much about the second ecumenical council where you get that acceptance of the monarchy of the father and it's essentially a rejection of filioque as well with the father being the sole cause um all the cappadocians stress that uh, ec ec ecstatically and so there if there's if the father's the sole cause then the son can't also be the sole cause thus it excludes the possibility of filioque uh, and you have to interpret the creed the, the niceno constantopolitan creed according to the cappadocian teaching is which is what that council says so that's typically the way that the, you know, the Orthodox approach the councils. Um, when I was Roman Catholic, I'd never heard that. I'd never thought about it that way. I didn't even think that there would be a difference between an Augustinian approach and a, and a Cappadocian approach. But uh, in terms of the state of the question in academia, it's not even that controversial. It's, it's pretty clear that there's a difference of approach. I mean, unless somebody's just mired in the Western view and, and has a, a an agenda to try to say that there is no difference. It's just kind of absurd. If you read on the Trinity, uh, it's, it reads very different from, you know, Basil's on the Holy spirit or something like that. And Augustine himself and on the Trinity says that he is unable to read the Greeks. So he admits his own sort of uh, defect in that regard. So, yeah. well, that, that's a, you know, and then that's a, another intriguing aspect of it to me is, um, the model of the Trinity um, in, uh, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, it, there seems to be. So what I liked about Catholicism was they seem to have this kind of, you know, robust uh, philosophy and theology, you know, that, that seemed to cover so many bases. And uh, the more that I learned about that I learned about Eastern Orthodoxy. It's like, you know, all these gaps there are in Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has more robust and, 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 and better explanations, you know, like when we talk about uh, ontology with like moral realism, you know, moral facts and things like this. Um, I was drawn to, you know, absolute divine simplicity um you know because we could just say it's uh 
it's identical to God, you know, it's, but it doesn't really, it just seems to kind of push the, the ball backwards a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then we look at the energies and essences distinction, uh, you know, it, it seems to make a lot more sense that, you know, these, uh, you know, we can have an, on, an ontology without uh, having all the issues, you know, that, that we have with divine simplicity or the way um, a lot of modern uh, apologists, you know, want to try and ground moral facts and uh, knowledge, abstracts, universals, and things like that. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, a part of it that I'm intrigued with. And, and one other part that, that I like is it, in Catholicism, there seems to be um, this almost like a divide between the common people and God. Uh, and, you know, there's, you don't have religious experiences, you know, or things, it, not your common people or, you know, things like, it, it, it may just be my experience. But, you know, I feel like I, I've had genuine religious experiences before. And, uh, you know, the uh, mysticism or, or, whatever they you know refer to it as um you know with the the prayers and um you know things the practices and eastern orthodoxy that that uh it's like uh they seem to be a lot more open to you know these uh kind of personal religious experiences is that well, I think that there have been times in the West when there was an overemphasis on scholasticism, which kind of led to a reaction in the Roman Catholic world into hyper mysticism and ecstatic sensualistic experiences with a lot of the women saints, uh, you know, who described their religious uh, myst mystical experiences in very what we would say delusional ways. Um, you know, Jesus, we don't think is Jesus is not carving his name into your chest. He's not giving you a circumcision ring. He's not making the host float around the room and telling you that you're his boy, that you're, that you and he are BFF and boyfriend, girlfriend. We think all that's delusion. And that was actually something that spending many years in the traditional Catholic world, I started, I was always kind of, uh, bothered by a lot of that being uh, protestant growing up so i just I think it just struck me as bizarre uh but i just always said well you know i don't maybe I, that's just my protestant hang-ups maybe i just don't get it um and I, then what i noticed was that i would meet you know a lot of people in the traditional catholic world who knew all this marian mystical gibberish and all these crazy stories and tales and all the legends of saint whatever but they didn't know anything about the scripture they, they couldn't even tell you the ten commandments but they knew all about all this all these uh, Marian apparitions and legends. And I just felt like this was something, something's off here. This is not making sense. It just doesn't, it's not what this religion is supposed to be. I mean, if that's the essence of the religion is just all of these recent Marian apparitions, then what did the church of the first thousand years have? I mean, they were missing that. If that's the essence of the religion and what the focus of the religion should be, then it should have been there all along. It should have been there for the first thousand years of the church. And yet that's not what we see. So, for me, what was really kind of the, the ultimate sort of determiner uh, between East and West, what's the true church between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, was to really just dig more and more into the councils of the first thousand years and to see what is the canon law, what does the pronunciation of those canons say? What's their mindset? And if Vatican I, for example, doesn't line up with the canons of the first seven councils, then Vatican I is an innovation. And that's eventually what I, I came to believe is that clearly we have synodality. We have uh, canonical privileges given to different patriarchs and sees. There is not this presence of uh, Vatican I, infallible, universal jurisdiction, supremacy, you know, uh, the charism of, you know, whatever. That's not there. Uh, and it, you can see, you can track the growth of it through the acceptance of these various uh, papal forgeries over the many centuries. Ubi Petrus has a great video on that, the history of papal forgeries that contributed to the schism between the East and the West. 
And, and of course, nowadays the Vatican has admitted, yeah, those are all forgeries. Yeah, sure, they contributed. So what? It's still true. Um, I just don't think that any of that holds water. And, and I think these things go together. The, the the lack of unified experience in the West for the saints, which is something very contrasted to the Orthodox Church. In other words, the Orthodox view of genuine uh, mysticism is that all of the saints in the in the orthodox church have the same experience whether it's moses on mount sinai or whether it's paul uh, or whether it's uh, saint gregory nazianzus or basil or saint gregory palamas throughout those centuries and those millennia the experience is one and the same it's all the experience of the divine uncreated light period that's it there's no uh, I'm going to go the dark night of the soul where Jesus carves his name into my chest. I'm going to go experience <laughs> the apparitions of blah, blah, blah. It's all just all, it's crazy. Uh, right. And that is an overreaction. Of, that's histrionics reacting against the excessive scholasticism, which led from this rationalistic, you know, logos obsessed approach to the extreme of a effeminate histrionic emotionalism that is anti-rational. And so both of those extremes are wrong, and they're really replacements for the authentic uh, Orthodox mystical experience, which is again the unified experience of the divine light. Uh, and that's why that's why Paul talks about the divine light. That's why Paul talks about the essence energy distinction that the energies of God are at work in him. That's the Greek word that he uses, the energeia of the spirit at work in him in his epistles. Um, and he's really, we would say, just speaking in line with what <clears throat> is the mosaic experience on Mount Sinai of Nobody can see God face to face, and yet Moses walked and talked with God face to face. How is that possible? Well, Jesus explains in John 5 to the Pharisees that Moses talked to him face to face. So Moses wasn't looking at the essence of God in this beatific vision, the originist view, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches. He wasn't directly seeing the Father. No man sees the Father at any time, Jesus says. The only answer after that is to say that Moses interacted with the personal energies of the Logos, of Christ himself, and so the essence energy distinction, the triadic view of the Old Testament is, is exactly perfectly the model of the experience of Moses, which is the experience of Paul in the New Testament, which is the experience of all the saints. So Trinity, essence energy distinction, uncreated grace, they all go together for us. Yeah, that, and that's, you know, the uh, like I was talking about there, you know, they're just seems to be a uh, much more robust uh, explanation, you know. Um, well, and also I think it's more faithful to Revelation. I mean, the idea that, you know, the essence of synergy things isn't just cooked up from some uh, philosophical speculation. We think it's faithful to the data of Revelation, that when Moses is interacting with the goodnesses of God, right, or his backsides, uh, that's the, the distinct, that's distinct from God who is in his inner being, his essence, that's God as revealed to us. And so that's how we can have a both and rather than an either or dialectical philosophy here of, well, it's either the essence of God or it's a creature. That's the Roman Catholic Latin extreme position, right? Where it's, it, this is the strict either or. That's what Barlium says to Palamas in the, the debate with, with the Akindino. So, uh, yeah, we have a both and rather than an either or. And that's, again, just faithful to the data of Revelation. It's, it's faithful to, for us, it's fundamental to explaining the theophanies. You know, if you have an absolute divine simplicity view, as we see in the in the on the Trinity, Augustine is he's at pains to explain how there can be a theophany. And he says, I, I think they have to be angels. Well, no, fundamental to orthodoxy. They're not angels. Read uh, St. Justin Martyr's debate with Trifo the Jew. He says these the theophanies, that's Jesus. Who do you think it is, Trifo, if it's not Jesus in space and in time? And if it's not possible for one hypostasis to manifest in space and time, well, then you're not a Christian because now you've implicitly denied the incarnation. You've denied that the second hypostasis of the Trinity stepped into time and space and entered into a mode of being, namely being incarnate, that the Father and the Holy Spirit didn't. So this is fundamental Orthodox theology, fundamental Trinitarian theology, and these other sects and these other groups are just all over the place because they're confused and they're wrong. So. How, how long did it take you to um, go from a traditional Protestant style worship to or, or get used to the liturgical style of worship? Was that because it's and I know it's my, you know, Protestant upbringing. Not only that, you know, the anti-Catholic, anti-Orthodox kind of positions that they held. Um, 
it just it seems so foreign to me uh you know the liturgical style of worship and um you know just the i mean i i, I understand you know the history behind it and the practice and and all that it's you know like uh not just the liturgical style but like um i think i was so i was the closest church that we have uh orthodox is uh antiochian or antiochian yeah. uh yeah. and you know i was so i was doing you know a lot of reading up on them and you know they were like touching the priest's robes for prayers or something you know uh, as you walk through with the incense or something like that. I, uh, and it just, with my background, it was just, you know, it seemed kind of odd. Uh, right, well, we just read that uh, in the liturgy, the reading in Luke, where the one with an issue of blood is uh, reaches out to grab the hem of his garment. And Jesus says, I perceive that power, dunamis, energeia, the essence of distinction, went out from me. And of course, Jesus doesn't, it's not that he lacks knowledge. He knew who it was, but he wanted to call attention to that act of faith on the part of the woman to teach his disciples something. Um, and so the purpose in the, in the liturgy, uh, when people reach out to touch the vestment of the priest is a reminder of that instance in the gospels, because uh, we see that the, we believe the priest is an icon of Jesus. And so he really is operating uh, not in his own person in the sense of his sins. We're not donatists, so we don't think that the sins of a minister affects the, uh, uh, the, the grace of the sacraments per se. Uh, we think that Christ is still present even in those actions, even if the, well, we're all sinners, right? So even in the liturgy, the priest says, uh, you know, even though I'm a sinner, you know, he prays, he prays that prayer in the liturgy too. But to answer the question about uh, why, how I went from that, I was in a weird turn of events as a reformed Protestant, a uh, pretty strict Calvinist. We held to the Westminster Confession pretty strictly. We had, a, ironically, a couple kind of disputes in my my local church and my little uh, Presbyterian denomination, which was really strict, over some things, which in a roundabout way kind of let led me into liturgical worship. So, for example, uh, we we had some debates amongst our little denomination about whether it, we should have instruments or whether it should be solo psalmody. Uh, or whether you know there should be head coverings, these kinds of things would come up for women, and so I started realizing that well, you know, as a sola scriptura adherent, it's very interesting that I believe in the regulative principle of worship. And if, for those that don't know, if uh, if you're in Calvinist circles, the hardcore strict Calvinists uh, believe in what's called the regulative principle, which is that you can't do anything in worship that isn't explicitly mentioned, and that sounds good maybe on paper but the problem is that when you go to calvinist churches and Protestant churches and you see this enacted in practice uh there's really not a clear new testament pattern of worship i mean paul talks about the pattern of worship the you know but he doesn't lay out how the service is and that's why you get all of these sort of disputes over the history of uh you know protestant worship what's what's allowed can we have an organ can we not do we only sing the psalms and so in a roundabout way, I started, I started thinking, well, maybe I should look to the early church because if the apostles went out and set up these churches, then maybe they kind of laid out a generic pattern of worship or, or a, a rough pattern of liturgy, so to speak, right? Um, and one of the first questions that came up, which also became a dispute between our denomination and some people that went into the Episcopal Church or the Reformed Episcopal Church, was what about uh, infant communion? And from my perspective, well, there wasn't really explicit texts that said yes or no. So uh, how, what do we do on this issue? And it was this big debate amongst people in the denomination. And so there was all these books and essays. And I, I saw I pulled out one of them because it reminded me of this. And uh, Lightheart, who was for a while a, a hardcore reform guy, I think he's now kind of in some loose Anglican quasi-Orthodox position. So Lightheart wrote this book, Daddy, Why Was I Excommunicated? <laughs> Back in the day. So I read that many, many years ago, and that kind of got me thinking, wow, so he's actually arguing there's an inter interesting case for pedo communion. And of course, no Pro yeah. Presbyterian church does pedo communion. Right. So I was thinking, well, maybe there's something to it. So then I, I, I did get a hold of some Anglican commentaries on liturgy. 
I visited an Anglican church a couple of times. I had no interest in Anglicanism, but I read some of their books and I thought, well, I guess I'm going to have to get into bigger issues that it's not really ultimately about what is the perfect early church form of worship. So I realized I wasn't going to be able to settle this issue with the regulative principle of worship. Uh, I was going to have to look at bigger issues like the formation of the canon of scripture itself, because I started realizing that kind of a more fundamental question was the canon of scripture. So then I read, I don't know, five or six books from Protestant, Anglican, evangelical, reformed, uh, Jesuit scholars on how the canon came to be. And what I noticed across that whole spectrum was uh, what everybody seems to agree on is that tradition has a key role in the formation of the canon. So then I was going to have to figure out, well, what exactly is that role? Is it equal to uh, scripture? Is it above scripture? Is it under scripture? Is there some relationship I don't understand? Uh, and that led me to back in about 2001, I got the church father set and I started digging and diving into that. I'm going to have to read these church fathers. I was taking classes at Bonson Seminary from a guy named Chris Strevel, who's a uh, still a Presbyterian minister, by the way. And uh, he said, all right, well, for class, we're, you're going to get this stack of church books on uh, ancient church fathers and medieval theology and philosophy. So I started diving into those. and I read the whole Pelican set and I read the uh, Cyril Richardson and I read uh, you know, these different uh, Anglican scholars. I think we use several Anglican scholars in that as well. And um, I started realizing, man, there's some stuff in these church fathers that I just didn't expect to be there. I didn't expect baptismal regeneration. I didn't expect the real presence. I didn't expect pedo communion. I didn't expect, uh, you know, these other so-called Catholic ideas to be there. And lo and behold, they are. And then I thought, well, now I'm going to have to expand into trying to figure out what is the early church's pattern of liturgical worship. And I noticed in Irenaeus and in Justin Martyr and in um, you know many of these uh, pre-Nicene fathers that they do talk about the liturgy. They do talk about a pattern of worship. And then when you get into the history of liturgy and, and the history of worship, it's not really even con that controversial that yeah. the early church in the first, second, third century had basically adopted universally a combination of the uh, synagogue and temple services put into a rough pattern of worship. And I realized, well, this isn't actually explicitly listed in scripture. I was already doubting Sola Scriptura. And then it just finally hit me that, well, there, 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 there is a regular principle of worship, but it's at the, the behest of the living church and the successors to the apostles who govern that church. Uh, and they're the ones who have the authority and the right to interpret and make these decisions. I'm not going to find some document somewhere that has the perfect worship service because when I started reading the, the ancient liturgies, whether it's the liturgy of St. Basil or the liturgy of St. Mark, uh, the liturgy of St. James, which are, again, go back very early, second, third century. And in, in some cases, the liturgy of St. Mark, I think is one of the oldest in Alexandria. And I noticed, man, this is just all straight up liturgical worship. It's all antiphonal. It's, uh, it's borrowed from, you can clearly see the synagogue temple services that we know of in the ancient world. Uh, and then, you know, I got a hold of great books like the, Antiochian Orthodox uh, Church put out this book, Orthodox Worship, Living Continuity with the Synagogue and the Temple by Williams and Anstall. There's another good one on this by Hugh Wybrew, which is the Orthodox Liturgy. And so the more that I got into the Old Testament, uh, and then studying the Old Testament as well, and the, the question of continuity between the Old and New Testament, uh, which was a big issue for Calvinists. Uh, I was a you know, super into covenant theology. So I think ironically, in a, in a roundabout way, I was as a Calvinist actually in, in ways prepared. And I was actually uh, in the Rush Juni reconstructionist camp. So I was really, really, I'd read a lot of Rush Juni. I read his, uh, uh, his institutes. Um, and so he had such a positive view of the old Testament and not just the penal sanctions, but even the ceremonial laws and the principles behind the ceremonial laws that really that uh, was just a huge warm up for me, even though I didn't know it at the time to understanding the the parallels between Old Testament temple and synagogue worship and the Orthodox Church is really the fulfillment of that. And so um, if you watch that documentary that our friend Lewis uh, made, which is uh, the Old Testament, New Testament worship in the Orthodox Church, I think that's like a perfect expression of, of what I came to. Uh, but it, it took me a long, long time to get there. Yeah, that um, it, it, so to me... Uh... 
it just you know for for years now i i haven't held to solo scriptura uh for years um you know bit i had uh, a conversation with um it was a catholic you know and you know, we were talking about you know proper interpretation and how do you get a proper interpretation you know mm-hmm. without some kind of uh uh, tradition or some type mm-hmm. of authority, you know, and, um, you know, and the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, how, how could Sola Scriptura be true when we're still interpreting it through man? You know, it, uh, so yeah, that, and something about the liturgical style of worship, I, I've been to, um, Catholic church a few times and there's something about it that just, it seemed more proper, uh, you know, it, it seemed more reverent in, well, I in mean, a lot of ways. How did Jesus worship? Well, he worshiped at his local synagogue and yeah, temple at the in temple. a liturgical yeah. way. Yeah. Absolutely. And and yeah, and that's what I was uh it, it having those already, you know, the more that I've learned about Judaism and, and uh you know the um practices and uh, of their temple worship, you know, how meticulous they were, how, you know, they had, uh, you know, they, they went through these, um, you know, in order they had, everything was, was very structured, Yes, you know, and, and it wasn't this, you know, go in there and get a good message and a good feeling and, you know, being manipulated by worship music and, you know things like that uh yeah so. exactly i and and I, I had a good you know time period experiencing you know the 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 reformed world uh coming out of the baptist world um and then going into uh the the roman catholic world in the sense of the latin mass for many years so uh, i mean i kind of went from like one <laughs> i mean i wasn't really into charismatic stuff i guess that would be the extreme of the opposite of the latin mass yeah, but yeah. um but i did go to actually to some novus ordo masses that were basically like charismatic protestant churches and i'd, I'd visited a few charismatic services back when i was like 18 with some of my friends and stuff but uh there's another book too that just reminded me of when i was a catholic and actually uh, this would, that book would actually benefit orthodox too because even though it's written by a catholic uh it's, it's a it's a well-known book by father meager and he actually gives all these fascinating uh, insights into how Christ said the first mass. And so for us as Orthodox, we wouldn't have a problem with this either because we would agree that, you know, the Latin mass in terms of the, the Western rite of the Orthodox is, is the Petrine rite, the Petrine mass. Uh, so there's nothing, nothing wrong with it inherently. Uh, so I'm not advocating Roman Catholicism, but that was another book too that I remember that helped me along the way when I was... Um, uh, kind of new to Catholicism out of uh, Protestantism, how there's all this stuff that I just didn't know about, you know, the history of uh, the, the connections between what Jesus is doing uh, in the upper room when he's instituting the Lord's Supper. You know, a lot of that is coming out of the Old Testament and it's he's playing on a lot of those even traditions that were part of the uh, the Passover ceremony. And so he's instituting his new Passover and, you know, for so long as a Calvinist, I viewed it like, well, that means he's fulfilled all those things. And so anything that you try to uh, continue on in the New Testament would be Judaizing or would be a heresy. But then I started noticing, well, in the early church, that would mean that they're all heretics. And so like the whole I mean, here I am trying to say that, uh, you know, uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Athanasius is a great defender of the faith. And yet, I mean, he's got all these traditions about, you know, the the uh, he he writes the festal letters for Easter. He talks about the lives of the saints. He talks about liturgical worship, the real presence. I mean, I just realized that I was I myself was cut off from the people that I thought I was a champion of, uh, and that I didn't believe anything like what they believed. Oh wow! So were you a full five point two look Calvinist? Yeah, I was like hardcore Bonson, Van Til, like I said, Reconstructionist. So you, you can't be a Reconstructionist if you aren't like a full, full. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the Reconstruction. I've heard the term. Um, it, that was uh, a movement kind of uh, out of the Bonson. Well, Bonson was part of it, but then there was R.J. Rush Jr., Gary North, and they kind of spawned this idea of 
um, Christianity that's uh, post millennial, that's uh, five point Calvinist, that's uh, um, they believe in applying Christian principles to the civil state. So you had to have a positively Christian civil state. Uh, what else? Uh, dominion mandate. Um, so it's the duty to not just uh, go to church, but to take over the institutions for Christianity. Uh, anyway, that's the ba- oh, you had to yeah. be a Vantillian. Th- those are the basic principles of re- Christian Reconstructionism. Yeah, it um, it, it when uh, it it's crazy because you know talking about all of the reformed the person who really got me interested in philosophy itself was actually R.C. Sproul. Um, And he used to have, you know, this, uh, like his lecture series, you know, the lecture series that he gave. I used to listen to his lectures too. Even even when I was hardcore into Bonson event, I still liked Sproul and I would listen to, you know, Sproul giving his Bible talks. Uh, I didn't really care for Sproul. I like his Bible talks better than his philosophy talks, but I I never really got the whole uh, Gerstner, Sproul, philosophy approach um i always agreed with bonson and ben till over those guys yeah yeah he he, the the first time i ever heard the word ontology and ontological argument and i was like what what is that i gotta you know so then i just kind of just fried my brain trying to figure it all out you know kind of jumping in midship uh did you go to to, uh study philosophy is that what no you no i am 100 percent layman um i uh you know like i said uh, growing up in kind of a rough poor neighborhood we really didn't have you know the opportunity to to go to college and um but i did end up you know going to a trade school learning a trade and uh well, you're philosophy. Probably better off. i mean college and university is overrated so it's brainwashing centers basically so yeah, it's uh well, you know, I, I I've been blessed. I mean, I made out pretty well, you know, after uh making pretty good money. But, you know, philosophy became like a passion and a hobby. Um and I just, you know, for about 12 years just been, you know, totally immersed in it. Um and started realizing, you know, wait a minute. I am a Christian. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, a few years back it, it was, uh, you know, I don't know anything about church history. I don't know about, you know, all the different. I mean, I had a decent theology, um, but as far as orthodoxy goes, I was totally ignorant. You know, didn't know anything about any of the church fathers, um, any of the, uh, you know, the apostolic um, mm-hmm. procession or, mm-hmm. or you know, the. Um, and I got a, I bought a book like it, uh, one of those thrift online things years ago Mm -hmm. of the writings of, uh, the early church Mm -hmm. fathers, you know, Polycarp and all it, and started reading them and was really surprised at, you know, how much I could follow what they talked about and, you know, uh, how there are, you know, a lot of similarities um, today, even in some Protestantism, you know, uh, to some of the ideas that they had. But mm-hmm. I had no idea what can of worms I was opening uh, <laughs> when I got into it. So uh, it's it's been a journey for sure. That's um, so how did it was it your study of religion? Did you like have. um like a love for film or the arts or and the study of religion that kind of mesh to, you know, uh, culminate in, you know, esoteric Hollywood. Uh, not really. I mean, they were two separate things that happened at different times. I mean, when I was in high school, I, I loved, we were all movie buffs. I was kind of in the artsy crowd of people. Um, I like theater. I wanted to be an actor, uh, I am heterosexual, by the way. Uh, <laughs> except <laughs> when you talk about being in theater and all that. So, um, but yeah, so I wanted to do that. And then uh, I just, the more that I tried to pursue that stuff when I was 18, 17, 18, I was pretty serious about it. You know, I, I was preparing to try to go to different art schools and whatnot. And that's the, the career path I, I chose. And I wanted to go down. And 
but I wasn't happy at the same time. And I, you know, I, at the time I had no religious interest at all. And, um, you know, that kind of piqued my interest in religion at the, at, at the time when I was 18. And so I started reading the Bible and I started going to various Bible studies, got invited to a lot of Protestant things. And, um, then I started going down a different path and, and I started reading books about comparative religion and, and, uh, different philosophies and history. And, and I was, my mom was an editor and a librarian. So I was always raised with, uh, you know, books everywhere, books, 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 books. And so I was predisposed to read and I love to read about all these different topics. And, uh, I, pr prior to that, my reading was typically like fantasy sci-fi stuff. So in high school I would read, but it was never anything serious. It was always, you know, Terry Brooks and Tolkien and, you know, fantasy sci-fi stuff. And then I, I was, the, every, everything changed when I was about 18. When I started reading the Bible and I, I thought, well, um, you know, I find other things interesting now. I, I, th I, I kind of grew up out of that stuff. And it's weird now because so many dudes are like all into comic book stuff. And <laughs> it's just like, you know, you're supposed to grow out of that, dude. You're supposed to become an adult and like get into, you know, real stuff, uh, you know, adult things. And yeah, so uh, it was two different interests and I never really expect or thought they would collide. But then when I was doing my undergraduate work, I, well, I would pick these classes when you get electives that I thought were interesting. And I, I always, I was like, well, you know, I was like movies and we were, they're having some uh, film classes. So I would just take film classes as electives for fun. And I was um, doing a philosophy and history degree. And then they didn't have at my school a uh, strict philosophy master's. So you had to choose a dual master's program of English and philosophy which was actually interesting because I got to combine a lot of lit and a lot of film classes and a lot of philosophy classes together. So it was this weird mix of things that, although I don't like the university system, I did enjoy a lot of the classes. And um, yeah, so it, it was just two different worlds that kind of ended up colliding. And when I got into grad school and was doing uh, master's work in uh, English and philosophy. I was I was at that time also expanding into reading a lot of geopolitical stuff, um, getting into a lot of espionage uh, history and that kind of uh, stuff. And I and so it, it's just like, well, there's a lot of movies that deal with this, and there's a lot of you know books about this, and then I'm writing papers about this, and then it just more it, over time it just all kind of collided. And I read a bunch of books on the history of Hollywood and intelligence agencies, the CIA's relation to Hollywood, and then I read. Uh, we had a, a couple of classes on uh, film and lit and Oliver Stone. I took a, cr a class on Oliver Stone's films and that professor was quasi uh, conspiracy minded. So we actually went through all these Oliver Stone films and compared them to the best accounts we have with historical events. And that was when I was thinking, man, this is nobody ever talks about the relationship between Hollywood and the CIA. That's like, but then I found out when grad school, actually, there is a little bit of a uh, academic interest in this topic. So there's a handful of academics that, that write about this out there, um, like Trisha Jenkins and the Operation Hollywood book. So I just started getting into that. And I was like, I want to learn more about this. This is fascinating. It's another domain of you know something that's interesting. So it just kind of in a roundabout accidental way came together and uh, I was going to do my master's thesis on Ian Fleming and James Bond as propaganda and end up having a falling out in the middle of writing the thesis with the uh, graduate advisor who was a super, super uh, Green Party liberal dude. And then I just took the, the essay and published it in a peer reviewed journal as it is. So that's actually the introduction to the master's paper that was never written. Um, and then I was just like, man, I'm sick of... Uh, I've been off and on in academia for all these years and I'm just tired of it. And then I just suddenly got the impetus. Like, I want to be my own boss. I'm going to go strike out, do it my way. Screw this stupid university system. That was the best decision I ever made because I'm way better off now for, for having done it. Um, I think that that's the old model uh, of doing things. The, the university way that's going yeah. away. Uh, that's the dinosaur model. So yeah, the, everything just, kind of happened on its own i don't know it was crazy so it, it seemed like the the books did pretty decent there's a a lot of positive reviews um i mean not that i expect anything else but um 
uh, well, there's know. a few haters. And what's funny is that if you read the hater reviews, you can tell they didn't read it because they always say, this is a crazy conspiracy there is. He talks about reptiles and QAnon. And I'm like, there's nothing in my books about reptiles <laughs> and QAnon. So clearly you didn't read this book. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's it, it did okay. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, a New York Times bestseller, but I didn't expect right. it to be. Uh, it, it did uh, sell more and do better than I did expect. Um, but uh, the, the great thing about the book was that it was fun to do. And, it, and it, I like the books. But they really just kind of opened up more doors to do other things. And so the, the most fun I had wasn't the book. It was doing the TV show. That was, I just loved, uh, I always wanted to do that kind of work, yeah. work in uh, media, work in TV. Um, and then it, it just ended up happening. And I never, never would have thought I would be doing that, especially, you know, five years ago when I was still doing grad work and right. miserable. I was like, I, you know, I would never dream that it would get to that stage. So, yeah, it was it was great to see it come about and come to fruition. Uh, I wish that we had done another season, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm happy for what they did make. But. Uh, also I look back and I'm like, man, I was fat back then, dude. Like <laughs> I was like, man, I wish I'd been trimmer and slimmer for, you know, the season of a TV show, which will forever be, you know, me as this kind of chunky dude. It's but okay. uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was a lot of fun and it, and it, uh, the TV show turned out better actually than I expected it to be. That was the most fun. And then I'm having a blast now, you know, just doing the fourth hour of Alex and, um, you know, doing what i do now so it's just it's really just it's almost surreal to be able to basically just turn on a computer and talk about whatever you're interested in and then that's how you make a living it's just it's just weird dude it, i never would have dreamt of it being this way and then at the same time like the world is dystopian and collapsing but yet I, it's just so weird like it's like a weird bittersweet mix of i get to do what i want to do for my dream job but at the same time the world's collapsing so i don't know it's just crazy yeah, I mean, you you got a heck of a following on YouTube, so it's kind of like, you know, that's like new TV now. I mean, who actually watches TV anymore? So <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean, everybody's going to, you know, podcasts and YouTube. And uh, I mean, look at Joe Rogan, look at, you know, a lot of the successful uh, podcasters and yeah uh, i think those guys all paved the way for the way it you know is is working now and, and you know the, unfortunately that's why they're trying to shut everything down and censor everything but yeah i think uh you know we'll, we'll just keep plugging forward and hopefully we can continue to i mean I, i'm happy to have done it for as long as i have done it so if it all goes away tomorrow i mean i was like well at least i got to experience you know <laughs> five years of being my own boss as a you know yeah, YouTube absolutely. podcaster or whatever you call this. So I promised you an hour. We're at an hour. Um, I uh, do you have anything that you uh, wanted to plug or anything? All of your links I've got in the description for your website, uh, YouTube and Twitter. Um, is there anything you have coming up or anything special, you know, then? No, just the same, uh, you know, we'll keep plugging away at the content that we are doing. Um, we're going to be doing decent in December, uh, where we, where we focus on Christian theme movies, positive movies, wholesome movies. We talk so much about dark, you know, degenerate films that it's, it's high, high time that we talk about, uh, wholesome things, especially as we get nearer to the, you know, this seat, this, this era of the liturgical cycle, you know, in terms of nativity. So, um, we'll be we'll be do, analyzing some good old movies and some good Christian films with positive themes for uh, the Hollywood podcast. Uh, I just hosted the fourth hour of Alex today, so everybody can go over to freeworldnews.tv and um, watch the uh, final hour breakdown that I did of the silent uh, silent silent wars for whatever the document is. I just went blank on the document. <laughs> this document that I have in front of me, uh, silent wars for quiet quiet whatever it is. I've been talking all day, so my mind is bush. But uh, yeah. I did that today. I plugged that. And then, uh, yeah, uh, that's all I can think of for right now. But um, okay. anyway, thanks for having me on. It was, it was a great chat. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, no, I I really appreciate you coming on, man. I, this is so much information. I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. <laughs> it's, uh, I appreciate the book recommendations. I'm definitely going to have to go back and take those titles down. Yeah, you'll so. like those. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, w uh, hope you enjoy the discord and you know we, we got a good community oh, yeah, in there I've, and we'll keep I've plugging away that as well uh, uh i'm a 
behind on that so we should have a, another open forum and voice chat pretty soon and in, in discord we haven't done that in about a week right yeah no i've learned so much since i've been there so cool um but other than that man i man i appreciate it thank you boss Absolutely. i'll let you have the rest of your night back all right thanks all man right, you have a good night oh you too bud. jay dyer so that was pretty cool I, oh man that was a lot to take in dude super smart uh <laughs> i've been watching um a lot of his stuff on eastern orthodoxy and uh finding you know eastern orthodoxy more and more compelling uh, by the day but so this is going to be the last show for the rest of this year uh whatever's left of it um i am working on uh starting off the new year i'm going to try to be more um uh, how do you say it uh content that's ah, I can't, i'm lost for words right now i just totally went blank thanks jay it's your fault your blankness rubbed off on me um more informative content uh not that you know learning about uh, all the guests that's been on i had totally stoked at uh, how many guests came on this year the caliber of guests um and everyone you know who's subscribed this year all the downloads that we have on the podcast uh all of you out there that are downloading the podcast thank you so much uh i think we're over i think it's about 2200 downloads and it's averaging about um 89 of every seven days so that puts it in the top 25 percent of podcasters and i'm just like blown away uh don't forget to like the video subscribe if you like the content uh i will be doing more interviews next year also um with you know as big a names as i can get on here but i i do want to produce uh more informative content such as being a lay person myself and being in philosophy as long as i have uh i want to do a series on um explaining philosophical terms and eventually getting into philosophical ideas and things in as much of a uh, layman way that i can um so got that coming up and and hopefully it's it it'll be successful hopefully people will like it uh they're going to be short videos because i have a really short attention span and so i tend to think that everybody else does too uh plus who wants to watch 10 15 minute long videos explaining something anyway thank you everybody for hanging out being in the chat the chat was lively uh i am so thankful for everybody that was here and We'll see you next time.